We're going to go right into a special presentation and uh, time with the speaker that we're really pleased to have here today. Um, Cyrus R. Vance, Jr. has been Manhattan District Attorney since 2010, and during that time his office has prosecuted a number of high-profile cases that you who are uh, New Yorkers are well aware of, not least of them um, cases involving financial crime. Uh, it is uh, an understatement to say that he is not only uh, the key prosecutor here uh, in the District of New York, but he is also an innovator uh, and leader in fighting crime, both in the state uh, and the tone that he sets for the nation and globally, his actions globally. Uh, among those innovations, um, his office has used money from corporate crime settlements for prosecutors in other cities to clear backlogs of rape kits for DNA testing. He's opened gym gyms for kids uh, that come with counseling and whatever to keep kids out of trouble on Saturday nights, and uh, bought smartphones that give police officers access to a wealth of data while they are on their beats. Uh, and of course, with regard to financial crime, uh, he has created a financial intelligence unit that's focused on SAR monitoring back in 2013. And in the same year, he formed the Cybersecurity and Identity Theft Bureau, a specialized unit that has successfully prosecuted hundreds of cases involving cybercrime. He is also a founder of the Global uh, Cyber Alliance, uh, an organization that, again, as I suggested earlier, uh, says something about the international reach of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, and one that also uh, puts his office into the fight against cybercrime and against uh, the, the finance of terrorism, something that I think he may talk about today. Uh, part of that cybercrime fight, he uh, has the a state of an art, the art um, cybercrime lab, uh, which was opened uh, in 2016, and it is the only uh, lab of its type that a local prosecutor has. Um, all of this is very important and very impressive, and to us it is also important and impressive that uh, Cy Vance Jr. was the inaugural speaker at this conference uh, in 2013. And he has returned to speak on a couple of other occasions, and so all of that is to say that we uh, are happy to see him today as a returning friend and are honored and pleased to have him. Please join me in welcoming Cyrus Vance Jr. Kieran, thank you very much. It's great to be here, it's great to be back, and it's a beautiful day in New York City. Uh, and I hope you get the chance to walk around this neighborhood. It is the fastest growing residential neighborhood in the city of New York. You wouldn't have thought that was possible uh, a number of years ago, but, uh, but it is. And if you were out this morning at about eight o'clock, you probably saw more dads and moms walking kids to school than you ever thought would have happened uh, in uh, this area near Wall Street. Uh, I'm grateful that you asked me to speak here today. Um, I think most of you know our office, it's uh, the Manhattan DA's office, is, but it's probably best known for Law & Order, uh, the longest running TV show in history. Uh, but I, I, had a, I, I have a sort of a, a strange relationship with Law & Order because literally after I was elected, they canceled the show, uh, which I really felt was, uh, I couldn't help but take it personally. But it's an amazing office, as Kieran said, I inherited an amazing office from some amazing, amazing predecessors who, who have had my job before me. Uh, Tom Dewey, Frank Hogan, Bob Morgenthau. Uh, and so this office has been uh, really deeply involved in uh, both international and uh, national and local law enforcement, and I felt very honored to, uh, to be able to succeed them. Uh, I also want to begin by just uh, acknowledging and thanking each of you for the work that you do. Uh, it is hard work, it is detail work, uh, it uh, requires uh, a lot of coordination and effort on your part, but uh, as Kieran mentioned, it is through working with you and with your support that we are able to do the work that we do, uh, including building sanctions cases as we have uh, in our office working with our federal partners. Uh, I. I know the issue of SARS is all, always comes up. I just want to tell you, we read them. Uh, 
We appreciate the work that goes into them. And what we encourage you to do is, if you're sending in a SAR and you think that actually we ought to pay attention to it, uh, uh, call us about it and let us know why you think this is important. And that'll help us uh, be able to better understand the difference between you know, one uh, disclosure and another. So uh, I wanted, to, in thinking about what I wanted to talk with you today, I've been here a number of times. And um, uh, today, though, I come here with sort of a different uh, feeling. Uh, the terrorism attacks, three in Great Britain in the last several months, Paris, uh, all the events that are demonstrating that the pace uh, and volume and velocity of terrorism attacks have increased. I'd like to talk about terrorism today. And I'd like to talk about how I view this from New York's perspective. And uh, I want to talk about three things in particular. One, uh, the need to keep New York law enforcement, because this is the number one terrorism target in the country, and perhaps certainly one, one of the ones in, most in the world, to keep our local law enforcement, uh, particularly our NYPD, well-resourced so the city can best defend itself. Uh, two, I want to talk about some urgent legislative actions that I think will be uh, necessary for us to uh, address uh, terrorism and, uh, and, and protecting our communities. And three, I want to talk about how we can form new alliances in this global world uh, that we're living in uh, to better collaborate and protect ourselves as a, as a world community. So let me start with what we need to do to protect New York, uh, and that is to support the NYPD. Many of you know that uh, the New York City Police Department has developed an enormous counterterrorism capacity that really began under Ray Kelly, and it began in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, uh, when the sense from Ray Kelly was that New York really needs to be able to protect itself. It can't, uh, it can't outsource uh, its, protect, uh, its, its duties necessarily to the federal government. And uh, that's when the New York Police Department's counterterrorism capabilities uh, began. And they've only increased and become more effective under the succeeding commissioners, uh, Bill Bratton and now James O'Neill. Uh, unfortunately, and I know this is something that happens unfor too, too often, uh, in the uh, recent budgets that are proposed by the White House, there are cuts proposed across the board, across the United States, but will disproportionately impact New York City and the NYPD probably most uh, because of the uh, severity uh, of the situation and risk we have with regard to terrorism attacks. Uh, the White House budget uh, cut 25 percent the Urban Area Security Initiative. Uh, it cut uh, totally out the non nonprofit security grant program. Uh, funding was zeroed out. And the State Homeland Security Grant Program, it cut by 25 percent. And uh, the collectively, uh, Commissioner O'Neill describes it this way. Uh, these cuts are going to directly impact the ability of New York police to protect the city. Uh, the Lower Manhattan Initiative, which is basically the cameras and all the intel that is gathered by the NYPD in Lower Manhattan, uh, the funding that would be cut out would be the funding that relates directly to that. He equates this to essentially requiring New York City to cut 600 police officers out of its force. Uh, and, and what I think uh, is always the legislative uh, fight between uh, cities and the, and the federal government, uh, this year, at this time, uh, with the risks that have been demonstrated around the world in terms of terror capacity, uh, we think this is the wrong time to be cutting New York City's ability to defend itself. And we don't think that sends a message uh, to the outside world uh, that is strong enough that we will support cities like New York who are on the front lines of terrorism with federal support uh, it, whenever it's necessary. Um, we also have to support the NYPD outside of the federal government uh, and local offices like mine who have the capacity because of the nature of the work that we do sometimes have funds available that can uh, and should be allocated to the NYPD. So Karen talked about uh, one such grant that we made. Uh, interestingly and totally unknown to me, the NYPD officers didn't have a device that was uniform to all of them. So they were talking with each other on their flip phones and their cell phones and uh, texting each other uh, without any uniform platform for communication. And so Bill Bratton and I sat down within weeks of my coming into the office because we had uh, a significant inf influx of dollars by forfeiture from the settlement of the BNPP bank prosecution. And I wanted to make sure that uh, we invested these funds for what I would call transformative criminal justice investments. 
and one was to deal with this uh, lack of communication protocols at the NYPD. The NYPD commissioner did not have a way to, with the push of one button, send a picture out of a, of a possible terrorist in the communities. Uh, that couldn't happen before. It couldn't send out a picture of a lost child or a senior who might have wandered off with Alzheimer's. Uh, they were unable to communicate immediately with their entire communication uh, program, 35,000 officers on every street corner in the city. So what we did was we uh, was worked with the NYPD. We gave them a $90 million grant that gave them this technology. Essentially, it's a smartphone, a special smartphone that's been uh, uh, built uh, to be able to access the information on the NYPD mainframe uh, out of one police plaza in their hand, in the streets, in every squad car uh, in the city. And that enables them now today to, for example, responding to a domestic incident in an apartment building, understand who's in the building, are there prior are there prior incident reports at that location to access uh, video cameras from police, uh, video cams from that neighborhood uh, to assess if they can get any information before they arrive, uh, to take fingerprints and to do any number of important things that make the cops smarter. That means they're going to be safer. It also means when they are at the scene and things are moving quickly, they'll be better prepared to uh, address what might happen. And that'll make the, the, those folks who are making the call uh, uh, safer as well. So it's this kind of support which we uh, thankfully are able to give the NYPD. Obviously the use of these devices for terrorism related uh, issues is, 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 is obvious. We had a bomb attack as many of you know last October in Chelsea. Two bombs, one went off uh, in, the, in the lower 20s on the west side and the other did not go off, uh, thankfully. Uh, nor was anyone killed thankfully when the first bomb went off. But the way they caught, one of the ways they caught the bomber uh, was to send out immediately, in, once they had an, an indication of who, uh, of who he might be, uh, they were able to send that out uh, you know, citywide uh, and also regionwide. And that's the kind of communication today that makes the difference. That individual was caught, I think, within 25 to 24 to 36 hours. It's an amazing work by the NYPD and the FBI. But that doesn't happen without technology being able to make the communications accurate, quick, uh, and that actually saved, that's going to save lives. Uh, we need to, uh, obviously, as Karen said, we need to leverage the intelligence that we have in our office and share that. Uh, we have 100,000 cases that comes through our office every year. It's an enormous intelligence source. And from that 100,000 cases, we've got to be looking, guided by uh, the, the, the FBI, the JTTF, and others, uh, what kinds of cases should we be looking at and uh, how do we throw flags on those cases. How do people finance terrorism? Well, they finance it through lots of illegal activities that are fraud. There's cigarette sales, uh, drugs, uh, credit card theft, and the like. And so we need to be able, as these cases come in and don't look like a case that's related to terrorism, be able to identify the identifiers so that we can flag that case and then perhaps uh, give special uh, investigation to that or bring in federal partners to see what they may know. But that's simply... Uh, Two things. One, it's uh, use of data, which is obviously key now, and it's collaboration. Uh, and that's what we intend to do and do do with the NYPD uh, by leveraging our resources and sharing them. Uh, we've got to continue prosecuting uh, fed, uh, terrorism cases through all available angles. Uh, typically, these are done through uh, federal prosecutors, and I think that's the right place typically for these cases to be prosecuted. But every now and then, uh, at least in our office, uh, we are the ones who are going to have to step up and do them. Uh, we have a state terrorism statute uh, in our office, which has been, which was uh, uh, passed in 2001, uh, but had never been used uh, until uh, for terrorism cases until we used it uh, several years ago in indicting two separate terrorism cases, both of which the, NYP, uh, the NYPD and us gone to the feds. The feds had looked at, and they did not think they were the. The, either wanted to prosecute them or were the right agency. But those two cases uh, uh, were prosecuted su successfully by our office, and they're just like any of the other homegrown extremist cases that you see. One uh, was a group who were buying guns and grenades uh, to, uh, to attack synagogues, and the other building pipe bombs to attack returning servicemen and women um, from uh, Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan. So uh, our offices, when called upon, have to be able to do this work have to be competent to do it, uh, and have to be synced in with our partners to be able to do the work. Uh, we need, secondly, uh, urgent legislative action on several fronts I'd like to talk about. Um, you, have, uh, uh, you, know, you have all kinds of uh, rules that require you to 
uh, know your customers and uh, uh, help gather uh, customer information when required by a judicial warrant. Um, you, are, uh, you understand the value of that. You understand how that value actually aids in the fight against terrorism and, and other crimes. Uh, the problem we have right now, and it's one that I've spoken out about a lot, and which is somewhat controversial, is that uh, the Apple iPhone in 2014 and uh, Google operating system closely following uh, were redesigned so that those phones could no longer be opened by the companies even in response to a court-ordered search warrant. Now you can ask yourselves why did they do this and there's lots of debate as to why they did it uh, and I won't, I won't spend a lot of time talking about that but the net effect is uh, look at my office. I have 533 iPhones in our lab uh, that we cannot open in cases ranging from terrorism finance to terrorism to sex crimes to child abuse to identity theft to cybercrime and the like. So, that's 500 cases uh, that we can't access the information, and who suffers from that? Well, the people who suffer are typically the victims in many of those cases. Uh, encryption is not just a federal national security issue, it's a local law enforcement issue. Ninety-five percent of the cases in the, war, in, the, in, the, uh, in the country are prosecuted in offices like mine. And so the folks who are affected by not being able to access this information as evidence are our neighbors, uh, our friends, uh, local folks. It's not just FBI agents and federal agencies. But I don't think we really, uh, in this country, uh, and I understand it's, it's, it's a little dense to get through it, understand the consequences of making people be able to communicate anonymously uh, through uh, the smartphones and the, and the internet as opposed to security. We all want security. Uh, we want to have, uh, uh, we don't want people to be able to get into our devices and I completely appreciate that. That's why we always have to go to a court to seek access to the warrant. But when we make these devices purposefully impenetrable, it's going to ultimately impact the ability that we have to protect our communities and, and also involved very much in cases uh, of terrorism. Uh, an example, the bombs that went off last October in Manhattan. One bomb went off, obviously was destroyed. The second bomb did not go off, but it was through being able to open that phone, not an iPhone uh, and not a Google phone, open that phone that they were able to identify who the bomber was in part, find him uh, and go arrest him. So. I don't know how to make it any plainer. Uh, if you don't have access to this information, there are investigative leads you're not going to get. And those are investigative leads that uh, aren't going to be answered by looking at metadata uh, because you can't get metadata immediately. The, the, this is uh, very real, important stuff the cops need to get at immediately. And, uh, and the, the encryption is, is making that more difficult. I'm down in D.C. a lot. I'm going to continue working on this. Uh, and uh, I think it's very important that I don't want, uh, what I want is, a, what I want is there to be a way forward as opposed to uh, simply uh, no movement on this at all. I think it's urgent and uh, I think Congress ultimately will agree down the road. I'm afraid it may be in the context of another series of attacks when this happens and they all of a sudden figure out, my God, we've got to have this information. And the tech companies, believe me, will not be happy uh, if Congress acts uh, as a result of, of terrorism attacks. It's going to be much more stringent regulations of them. Second, we need to pass the Transparency Incorporation Act. I know that there's been a lot of movement done on this by FinCEN, uh, and we think that's great, but we believe in our office uh, that we should have a federal, uh, a federal law which would require at the incorporation of any company uh, the requirement to identify the beneficial owners and controlling interests of that corporation. It's ironic indeed when the prosecutors in the Cayman Islands have more information about who owns uh, the interests in corporations than we do prosecutors in the United States. Uh, I think it's time to wake up uh, and to understand that uh, it's important from many perspectives to have this information, have it at the time of incorporation, and not just sent to FinCEN as a separate information stream, uh, because often we find that we are looking into companies that are being formed, uh, and then we run into a brick wall uh, at the state level and are not able to uh, to move forward at the speed uh, we need to or sometimes move forward at all. Uh, getting this information ultimately I think is about public safety. It's about making sure that financial crime can be identified and prosecuted. It's also it also relates to terrorism obviously. Uh, so this is a law that we think uh, despite the good work that's been done uh, needs to be broader and needs to be passed soon. Third, uh, we need to reject legislation that would facilitate terrorism by firearms. Uh, 
I was in London, as Karen was, right before the uh, second London attack. I was there the day before uh, and left after speaking, was meeting with the chief of the city of London police on, on, uh, on uh, uh, cybercrime issues and international partnerships we have. Um, and as the first responders in London were trying to secure the crime scene, uh, the president tweeted this. Quote, do you notice we are not having a gun debate right now? That's because they use knives and a truck, exclamation point, end quote. Um, it's ironic the president said that because it's actually a really good idea that we have a debate right now about guns in America. Uh, three attackers in London were highly organized, uh, but they only killed seven people. And I say only, understanding that that's itself a huge tragedy. Uh, because they were dealing with knives uh, and, and not guns. Uh, let's take a different case in the not-so-distant past. Omar Mateen, one person uh, down in uh, Orlando, Florida in 2016, I believe. Not well organized, not well trained, but he had guns. He had access to guns and he slaughtered 49 people in, uh, in a matter of minutes. So, uh, the difference between the number of deaths and the scope of uh, the impact uh, is, may very well depend upon access to weapons. And that's why, uh, certainly as a, a DA in a big urban area like myself, uh, I think we need to be very clear and candid about uh, America's uh, uh, and, and gun sales. And, and, and believe me, I think states, I believe people should be able to own guns, but I believe that uh, states like New York, uh, who have done so well by uh, restricting those who can own guns, particularly in the city, created laws that really work for New York, uh, has been able to incredibly reduce violent crime in this city. And anything that risks that, uh, that steady uh, reduction in violent crime is something that I'm very, very concerned about. Um, we had 2,300 homicides in 1992, I believe, in New York City. We had 335 last year, roughly. So that's the level of decrease uh, that we've had of violent crime in New York because of our ability, in part, uh, to regulate who gets a gun. Now, but there's, uh, beyond just the issue of uh, appropriate local regulation of, of, of guns, uh, we also have to look at this in the context of uh, today's terrorists. Mateen's uh, slaughter uh, was undertaken by Allah's permission, and I'm quoting, according to this past May's edition of the magazine Rumiya. Uh, ISIS has an online magazine, Inspire, ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda has Inspire, ISIS has Rumiya. And uh, I want to tell you, I want to talk to you a little bit about the text of this magazine, less than several weeks old. Uh, the same article uh, wrote, and I'm quoting again, um, urging its jihadists who it's reaching into their living rooms all over America and the world, urging them to become armed with a firearm, then assault a busy public and enclosed location. Uh, that sounds tragically like events we see all too often. And then it goes on to say, quote, having gained control over the victims, one should then proceed to slaughter as many of them as he possibly can before the initial police response, as was outstandingly demonstrated by the Mujahideen who carried out the Baclatan fear massacre during the course of the Blessed Paris raids. This is last month, May 2016. Here's the point. The next paragraph, acquisition of firearms. The acquisition of firearms can be very simple depending upon one's geographic location. In many U.S. states, they write, anything from a single-shot shotgun all the way up to a semi-automatic semi AR-15 rifle can be purchased without requiring an ID or gun license. And it's in this context, this where we are in history and at our risk of terrorism attacks and the tactics that are used by terrorists today uh, to kill folks all over the world, it's in this context that our Congress is poised to move forward to pass the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act, which has been introduced for the third time in both the House and the Senate. Um, the CCRA, as it's called, is very simple. It requires each state to give full faith and credence to the gun possession laws of any other state. So if someone from Idaho comes into New York City, Idaho, where there is permitless, that is, you can just buy a gun without getting a permit and have the right to carry it concealed, under this law, that individual would be able to bring one, two, three, four, five of these guns into New York City and be completely legal. There would be nothing that the police could do to prevent that or the prosecutors can do uh, to prevent that. And once here, um, 
obviously, if, it, uh, if there is no law, that makes it harder for uh, terrorists to acquire firearms and come into New York City. Uh, then what follows is the possibility that someone who is a terrorist is coming into New York City, knows there's no deterrence because they can't be stopped by the police, can walk in the middle of Times Square, pull out uh, their concealed carry gun, and, and do what they intend to do. Um, Twelve states right now in the United States have permitless uh, laws, that is, you can just walk in and buy a gun. And this is the number one NRA legislative push for 2017. So, uh, legislatively, um, I'm trying to tell you or paint the picture that there is a link between the strength or weakness of our laws in the United States about gun possession. There's a link directly to homegrown violent extremists. And you don't take my word for it, take the word of uh, uh, Rumaya Magazine and ISIS, who just, uh, who just gave, uh, gave the calling uh, to its mujahideen to go buy guns in permanent states and bring them to uh, other locations and, and kill people. Now, um, before I leave this, I want to tell you, uh, and bear with me, to do anything that would increase the risk of New Yorkers being killed by guns when we have worked so hard as a community, police, prosecutors, this community, to reduce gun violence the way we have and made this the safest big city in the country and one of the safest in the world, to do anything to turn the clock back toward 1979 or 1980, knowing every town estimates that two million guns will come into the city of New York concealed every year from America if this law passes. Now, that means guns coming into Times Square theaters, office buildings, parks. Uh, that's going to do a couple of things. It is going to radically increase the risk to our police officers who are on the front lines and who are going to have to be uh, tasked with knowing the laws of 49 other states uh, before determining how to answer, how to, how to respond to a person with a concealed weapon. Um, there are going to be more people shot. I mean, we're all... Can you imagine having 15 people or 20 or 30 people in the middle of Times Square uh, uh, when, when there's some argument over a fender bender or two guys get out of a bar and cause, a, and cause a, a, an incident where uh, people's emotions get high? Uh, my, my emotion gets high over this. Uh, I think it is uh, so wrong and so, uh, uh, so foolish that uh, we actually have 35 senators in the United States who sponsored this bill. Um, and let me tell you this. You got to ask yourself, who's going to pay the price for this legislation? Who's going to pay the price for introducing 10,000, 500,000, a million guns into New York City? I'll tell you who won't pay the price. Who won't pay the price are the legislators in Washington, D.C., who don't live here, who don't live in the number one terrorism target of the country and one of the biggest terrorism targets in the world. So they won't pay the price, but our cops will, our visitors will, our residents will. And uh, what I hope you take away from this is, uh, uh, is that there are consequences to uh, these kinds of uh, court, these kinds of legislative actions that we need to keep our, our eye on. Let me close by just talking about the Global Cyber Alliance, which Kieran mentioned. Uh, I believed about three and a half years ago that I, we'd worked, we built our cyber lab up, we were doing great enforcement work on cyber. Uh, but I realized at that time that no matter how many cyber cases we prosecuted, uh, we really weren't bending the curve. We could not, the, the explosion of cyber is so great that individual prosecutions had some deterrent effect, and we're going to keep on doing them, but simply the, the cyber uh, pace is too great. And so we decided to focus on prevention strategies at a global level as the next place to be in fighting cybercrime. I went to my friends at the City of London Police, who are the cyber investigators for the UK. We formed a not-for-profit together called the Global Cyber Alliance. I'm funding it initially out of our forfeiture dollars. And what it today is, is a collaboration of 160-plus big companies and uh, municipalities who are across borders and across sectors uh, working collaboratively to design solutions for some of our uh, most uh, important cyber problems. Uh, what we don't have uh, often in America or the world is uh, sectors talking to each other about this issue. Transportation, health and hospitals, aerospace, uh, and, and the like. We have financial institutions maybe talking to each other, but we're not talking across sectors, and we're not talking enough across borders. And we don't really, in my personal opinion, don't look at cyber for what it is. It is an international crisis. It's a tsunami. 
And either we get together as an international community, we start talking to each other about it, and we start working towards solutions to prevent it with each other, or I feel we're going to be basically playing uh, more independent defense than uh, coordinated offense. So the Global Cyber Alliance uh, uh, has a, uh, one of the things we've been able to do in the last uh, year and a half is to develop uh, toolkits that address the most prevalent uh, cyber problems, which is phishing. Uh, that's, you know, that's 95% of the attacks come, in, come from someone opening uh, an email that comes into their business or by going to a site that's, uh, that's uh, infected on the outside. So we have basically developed toolkits which we are open sourcing. It's a not-for-profit, it's free, uh, and we are providing these to businesses and, and others who want to harden their defenses uh, using the technical tools DMARC and DNS, and I won't get into it because I'll probably screw it up and you probably understand it better than I do. But the, the point is that we can reduce the cyber threat, reduce the incidence of cyber crime internationally if we coordinate, if we collaborate, if we share information. And at the end of the day, that's what you do. That's what you do. Uh, you put aside often individual profit and personality to, uh, to work together for a greater cause to protect the country. I thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you're here today, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to spend a few minutes talking with you about my concerns. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, those are very moving remarks. Obviously, uh, also slightly frightening, uh, the, the, uh, the thought of um, a heavily armed New York and um, I think some pause for people here to think about whatever they can do to prevent uh, the Senate from acting in this way that doesn't, if I may editorialize, seem in the interest of uh, <coughs> New York. I'm, I'm not sure if it's in anyone's interest, but uh, certainly not us as New Yorkers. But. You know, um, you mentioned, and uh, we, we just have a couple minutes for questions, um, but I'm going to take those couple minutes to have you return a little bit to the international work that you've done. And we're all sobered and saddened uh, by the London attacks. Um, you've had real links to the Metropolitan Police. In the wake of the London attacks, um, how is it beneficial that you have those links? I mean, you're obviously sharing information and whatever between well, I, it, it again we are a state office and so I don't presume you know, I don't presume to try to be the the, the, the center of uh, counterterrorism but we have to find a way to help that's period you know you can't be in the Manhattan DA's office in Manhattan and not find a way to be a, a, a participant so for example in the Bataclan attacks we were in communication with uh, some of the government entities to uh, who, who asked for assistance uh, uh, which we were able to provide in, uh, in very you know, focused ways. Uh, uh, obviously, the principal sharing of information is going to come at the federal level, uh, but the, uh, there is, you know, at the end, when an attack occurs, I, my philosophy is that uh, everyone should know that whatever we can do here in New York with, by way of subpoena or by, by way of investigative resources that may not be immediately available to uh, the European government that they should know that they can call they can call and we will we will help uh, and so Karen is it's essentially uh, uh, some of these are longer term investigations and some of these are short uh, requests from information but if you don't have that relationship if I didn't know the city of London police commissioner if I wasn't a friend with the Paris prosecutor uh, our ability to do those kinds of joint investigations simply would be much more difficult and so today uh, in this world, I think New York has much more in common with Paris and London than the governments of the United States have, has with uh, the French or the English. It's really the, the cities and the folks who have the same problems and those people in them who are managing those agencies who should, who should it, I believe, are communicating directly with each other and not having to rely on, uh, on, on, on federal approval or, or a federal channel to make those, uh, to have those communications. Well, and then putting that into the context of this conference, um, what should folks be aware of? Uh, you know, the kind of the, your cooperation. You've you've had a number of initiatives with financial institutions, including a, a human trafficking uh, uh, initiative. Uh, how can they fit into helping in this uh, effort on terrorism? Well, I, I know Mike Sachs, who runs our investigation division, is here today. I think we are getting a lot of cooperation. 
uh, from, uh, uh, from financial institutions. And I believe, actually, I don't think I can go into it publicly, but we have some, some very productive uh, programs ongoing with the financial institutions that are helping us to identify through you know, computer forensics uh, where IP addresses uh, are coming from and the like that, that, that may relate then to the bank's ability to get information from there. So, look, you all know what the banks are. Uh, you have the data, uh, and, and whether it's sex trafficking or child trafficking or terrorism, uh, a lot of money is going to be moved through your institutions, or, and so you are on the front lines. And, I, and, and we really appreciate that we have uh, your help, because we could not do the job that we're expected to do without it. Uh, I have a lot more uh, questions to ask. I unfortunately do not have a lot more time to ask them, which, uh, which may be a comfort uh, to all uh, who are hungry. Um, I'm going to ask you to stay in your seats for a few moments. Uh, I'd like to invite up Patrick Brennan, who is the Enterprise Sales Director for uh, Digital Reasoning. And I would like to also ask you to uh, join me in thanking uh, Cyrus Vance, Jr. for his Thank remarks. You. Thanks a lot.